Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and what follows is an excerpted clip from one of my longer webinars. So what I've decided is that sometimes when people ask really interesting questions, I will pull out that particular part of a webinar and make it available to you as a short clip so that if you don't have time to watch a one-hour webinar, you can at least watch and listen to the brief exchanges that I usually have with people who attend my webinars. So here is one such clip from a recent webinar. I hope you enjoy it. By now, um, we know that Jibril was transformed into a sort of an angelic character and Salahuddin had been transformed into his opposite, which is he looks like the devil, he looks like the Satan, and he has they both have two different experiences. He's arrested, put in a van, beaten by the police, even though he's telling them I'm a British citizen. And suddenly this whole idea of his identity is coming to crisis, right? This identity that he had built over years by distancing himself from the past and um, formulating what he thought was a British identity, right? An English identity. Then he ends up at that weird hospital where all the people who have been labeled something have taken those shapes, right? The tigers, and these are all the fears of the British society confined in that place, experimental place, right? In that lab, and they break out, right? And he decides to go to his home to tell his wife that he's alive. And of course, you know, that's where, of course, she freaks out. I mean, you know, first of all, he doesn't look like who he was. He looks like a monster. And that's where he also finds out that his wife is having an affair, or probably not an affair, a relationship, because he's supposed to be dead. And, uh, you know, he gets kicked out. And then one of the lover of his wife, Joshi, is the one who says, come on, let me take you somewhere where we can take care of you. And that's when he takes him to the Shandar Cafe, right? And now remember, th this section is entitled A City Visible but Unseen, right? So this is the immigrant part of the town of London, right? This is where all the immigrants live. This is their community. It's sort of a poor community. Also, there's a lot of crime, but there is also a lot of racial crime, right? And we are introduced to two characters who own the Shandar Cafe, you know, Sufyan and Hind, his wife. They are immigrants from Bangladesh, right? We know that in the Jahiliya section, section of the novel, the Grandi is based on the historical character of Sufyan, Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of the Quraysh tribe. But his wife, both in fiction as well as in history, is named Hind. And Sufyan's wife here is also named Hind. So they own an Indian restaurant, right? And they have two daughters, almost grown up in their teens, 18 and 17. And then they own, a, own the building. So the restaurant is on the first floor. And then they have apartments upstairs, which they rent to people who are waiting decision on their uh, right to stay in UK. So mostly the asylum seekers or undocumented people, right? Now, that's where Joshi brings him, right? And in a way, symbolically speaking, it is, you know, um, what's his name? Salahuddin's re-entry into his own culture, right? This is the part of his heritage that he had completely erased to become a British citizen or to become British. So now at this moment, it's kind of symbolic, it's important 
that he is being brought to the very thing that he had jettisoned from his identity, maybe to cure himself, right? So not India itself, he has already visited India. He was coming back from there when the crash happened, but a community of Indians and other immigrants right where he has lived most of his life in the city of London. So that's understandable, Sufyan is telling him that, you know, where else would you go? You look like the devil, right? You go to your own community to heal, but maybe it's not just the physical disfigurement that he's talking about. I mean, think of it most of the time, where do we go to recover from emotional injuries, the emotional wounds? We go to our family, we go to our friends, right? But that's the next sentence is really, only when Saladin Chamcha was alone in the attic room, at the very end of his strength, did he answer Sufyan's rhetorical question. I'm not your kind, he said distinctly into the night. You are not my people. I have spent half my life trying to get away from you, right? So, so this is a sort of an acknowledgement on his past, right, of willingly having abandoned his own Indian identity and imprinting upon himself, right, an English identity. And right now, this is, we have already seen his experience with police and others, is the crisis of that identity. Where do we go from there? What we get then is part of his own history, not necessarily his coming from India, but mostly how did he become the voice actor, right? The promoter that we hear about who's like gung-ho, chauvinistic British, who tells him, you know, there are only limited things you can do because of the color of your skin, like people of your own pigmentation, he says, or persuasion. And that's how he becomes a voice actor. He also makes a friend whom he calls, right, who is Jewish, right? And she also has to, has had to make a culture in doing voiceovers, right? And then he does voiceovers that can transcend anything of, or he can give voice to anything. But in the process, he does not have a voice of his own. So that is his struggle going on. And, you know, there are subplots here. You know, the young women find him fascinating, right? They are second generation British. Uh, they are already rebelling against their parents, but they they find him to be cool, right? And so he gets adopted by these people, even Sufyan and his wife, who is opposed to it. You know, they give him a place to stay. Meanwhile, in the neighborhood, a lot of things are happening. You know, there is there are protests going on right? Uh, there are these grisly murders being done of older women, and it's some kind of a Jack the Ripper character, and he's only targeting immigrant women. And there is a lot of fear in the street, in this neighborhood, fear against, um, you know, racism and all. So people don't go out at night, or if they do, they go out, you know, in groups. So there is a lot of racial tension uh, going on over here. Now, I'm going to pause a little and go to like the structure of this section. So the first section is um, Salauddin Chamcha coming to Shandar Cafe and to this predominantly um, uh, immigrant neighborhood, meeting new people who adopt him you know, who help him cure himself. And then as the two young women with their musician friends, as they take him out of the hotel because he's outgrowing it physically and take him to the recording studio of a musician friend, what we see of him the last time is that he goes through these convulsions and then he completely transforms back into his human shape except for his eyes. He still has, you know, the terrifying eyes of the devil or Satan. That's where Rushdi leaves us with Saladin in this part. And then the second part is Jibril Farishta's story, right? How 
he ends up on Ellie Cohn's front yard, you know, unconscious in the snow. How, you know, she takes him in, right? They had already had an encounter back in India. And now, you know, they, they enter this really uh, conflictual kind of amorous sexual relationship. But Ali Khan, we, we find out that as she was growing up, she uh, was pretty confident and promiscuous and outgoing. But after her sister dies, she kind of withdraws back and, and has never really allowed anyone in, right? And even though she's flat-footed, she made it her life's mission to climb Mount Everest. We also know that during that climb, she had some kind of a spiritual experience. And part of the message that her guide, her Sherpa gives her is that don't attempt it again, right? You will not survive the ascent. And so part of it is his relationship with the Himalayas and the experience of mountain climbing, okay? And that's kind of her spirituality. Now there is also kind of a connection to the Jahiliya section in this part of the, in part five. And if you read it carefully, you will understand that the, the boundary between the two sections, the contemporary parts of the novel and the historical part of the novel, those are sort of becoming more permeable. Right, there are moments in this section when Saladin is imagining things that we will only be aware of if we had read the Jahiliya section. And as we go to Jibril, we already know that he is experiencing the same things that he experiences in his dreams. So the trajectory of the two characters is Saladin enters his own community. He doesn't claim it to be his own community, but that is where he goes to heal. He meets new people, all of them immigrants, all of them struggling, different generations, different parts of the world, but all live in that poor community. And then we have uh, his transformation at the end back to his own self. But by this point, he has lost everything. He has lost his marriage. He's lost his career. He's been let go. He can't go and work again. We don't know what will happen to him, but he comes back to his human shape, except that his eyes are still devilish. We don't know what that would do. On the other hand, Jibril, you know, is with Ali, has a fight, walks out, and suddenly starts walking around the streets as Jibril the angel, right? And no one speaks to him. No one even takes notice of him. No one even considers him an angel. But before he does that, he's already in talks with this producer, Batuta, right? Um, who is actually modeled after a famous British um, Pakistani immigrant whose name was Mahmood Sipra. He was a um, shipping tycoon and got involved in so many scams and was finally arrested. So Batuta and Jibril decide they were going to make a new uh, theological. And on my, it is on page 272 on my, so they are planning to make a new movie. The film was to be what else, a theological, but of a new type. It would be set in an imaginary and fabulous city made of sand. All right, so the, now the novel has become self-referential, right? We know about this city made of sand, right? But another character is planning a movie, and it's Jibril, but he is doing what he does best, right? Transforming his nightmares into movies. That's what he has done all his life. It would be set in an imaginary and fab fabulous city made of sand, and would recount the story of the encounter between a prophet and an archangel, right? This is the story we have been reading, archangel. Also the temptation of the prophet 
and his choice of the path of purity and not that of base compromise. It is a film, the producer, Sisodia informed Sign Brits, that's supposed to be a film magazine, right? About how newness enters the world. We have read these words before, right? How newness enters the world. Certainly not, Billy Batuta insists. Uh, but would it not be seen as blasphemous, a crime against? Certainly not, Billy Batuta. He's the producer insisted. Fiction is fiction. Facts are facts. Our purpose is not to make some Farago like that movie, The Message, in which whenever Prophet Muhammad, on whose name be peace, was heard to speak, you saw only the head of his camel moving its mouth. That, excuse me for pointing out, had no class. Okay. So this is within the body of the novel, enactment of possibly a movie made on this sand city, which is created in this novel. Rehearsing the debate about the controversy and why it could be considered blasphemous. Jibril Farishta, you know, while he is still in London, is already planning a comeback. His uh, producers have already started sending news about his forthcoming movie, his comeback movie. Um, they are promoting the film, right? So he is also returning to what is his normal, which is he makes films, right? He acts in films. So by the end of the novel, after he has had a fight with Ali and walked out, and done his angel thing, but no one paid attention. What we where we find him is back where he had started, right? Back at the door uh, of uh, Ali, and uh, before that, we also experience what we think is one more of his hallucinations, where he decides he's now become the angel Jibri, at least in his imagination. But he's hovering over London and he says, you know what, I'm going to change the weather of this city. I'm going to make it uh, tropical. And while we're reading it, we're thinking this is he hallucinating. But as he reaches back to Ali's home again and she finds him unconscious and brings him in, her mom and her are having a conversation. And her mom basically says, look at this weather, right? It's hot. So... What we are to extrapolate from that is that what Jibril was thinking has actually had an impact, physical impact on the weather. So that's roughly the summary of this part and what transpires. Now, what can we read in it, having read the rest of the novel, and what do you think about it? Please feel free to post your questions. I'm here. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this brief clip. If you are interested in the longer version, the link will be in the description and you can watch the whole webinar. Thank you so much for your support. And as always, if you have any questions, any concerns, you can always post them in the comments and I'll be happy to respond to them. If you have a moment and if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do so now so that you get timely notifications of whatever is happening on this channel. Thank you for your support. Stay safe and as always, from me to you, peace and love.